Father, we thank you for, again, the opportunity to come and to learn and to think about uh, and see the way that you interact uh, with humanity. And uh, your, your word is, is rich. Help us to have that discernment this morning as we think about uh, these topics and uh, how they play out in the gospel. And uh, so we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so <clears throat> we've been uh, going through different rebellions. We're on the third rebellion. First rebellion was Adam and Eve, uh, including Satan, if we want to throw them, lump them in there, the, the Genesis 3 rebellion. And then we saw the Genesis 6 rebellion. And now... What we did last time is we kind of laid the theological foundation for understanding this kind of weird um, episode of God scattering people and changing their language. And um, so, again, I think, I mean, it, in the sense of um, just, there's some strange things in the Bible, things that we would not generally, uh, if we didn't know the Bible, we'd go, What? God flooded the world and killed everybody except for eight people on a boat. Really? You actually believe that? And uh, it seems odd. It seems an odd way to judge. Um, and then when you have the, the, the tower coming along, what we were talking about last time, just on the top of page two there, was the timing of this, that mankind in, in Genesis 8.21, after they came off the ark, um, Moses writes that man's heart is wicked continually, even from their very youth. And we saw that in Genesis 6, 5. So prior to the flood, there's this wickedness. The flood happens, but Noah and his family are still humans. And so there still is this innate sinful nature. And, uh, and it's going to uh, expose itself at different times and in different ways. And so when God had commanded them to fill the earth and go multiply and, you know, I'll keep my covenant with you in Genesis 9. Um, they tend to do the opposite. We're going to gather together and we're going to make a city and we are going to uh, make a name for ourselves. So it's interesting, you know, just God does is, is I think part of the, the testimony of scripture is to reveal how patient he is throughout all of human history and how stubborn and obstinate we are. And uh, I'll even say this, that I really do think that is one of the themes of the entire scripture. Because even in the kingdom, when Jesus returns, you know, I believe it's going to be a literal 1,000 year kingdom. Uh, even during the kingdom, where he's sitting there, you know, gentle Jesus, loving Jesus, and he has to rule with a rod of iron. Satan's going to be bound. The demons are going to be gone. Just him and humanity. And even there, uh, humanity has to be ruled. I mean, we're talking about, we're going to be our new bodies, not us, right? But there'll be other humans that'll be like us now. They'll be regenerated. Um, and they will be, um, you know, living under the new covenant in that paradise on earth. But even there, he has to rule with a rod of iron. Uh, he, he rules with, uh, there are threats. You know, in Zechariah, it talks about that if the nations don't come and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles at Jerusalem or send representatives, God will send them no rain. And so here you have, even though Satan's gone, something is still in the heart of man. So even as believers, we still have this nature. And... God it allows it to play its course. And then at the end, he finally gets victory over it all. But it's interesting how long he allows it to play its course in order to reveal to us, really, it's kind of a weird phrase, the sinfulness of sin. You know, that's in the, in the New Testament. So anyways, when we, I just wanted to quickly review this idea of the theology of God's, we, we saw on the first page, the, the theology of God's abandonment, okay? And well, we won't review all that, except to say God reserves the right to abandon us to ourselves and to separate himself, to distance himself for his own reasons. Then we saw the theology of God's allotment or portion, which is really odd. This, this is really odd in that um, we spent all this time at the beginning of the study 
describing how there are these Elohim, these spiritual beings. Let's just let's get that. Spiritual beings. These spiritual beings are, some of them are part of his divine council, some are angels, some are cherub, you know, seraph, you know, all these different Michael, archangels, not just regular angels. So you have all these beings that are there, the hosts of heaven, you know, countless. And um, what we see here is that they're real. They're not, I mean, everybody would agree that there's angels, but in the sense of some people have a really difficult time of them being called gods. Because, again, we talked about that. In our English, we struggle with that. But the, the Hebrew calls them gods. G-O-D-S, little g's. It doesn't have a problem with it. It doesn't apologize for it. And, and the problem for us is we have big G and little g. Hebrew doesn't have big ca capital letters and stuff like that. Greek does, but he, Hebrew does not. Isn't there verses, though, that say he's the only God? Correct. So how can there be, if there's an only God, how there's a little g? Those, if they're still gods, because he's the only raised up God. He's he's the what? Yahweh. He's the only Yahweh. Uh -huh. And if you if see for us, it's 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 worth a quick review. See, we, we tend to think in terms like this, and and we get stuck here. So there's no doubt the Bible teaches there's only one uncreated Creator. Right. But it doesn't use our English specifications it just says think about it think of this are you are we against stating that angels and Yahweh are all spiritual beings no see so just get rid of this get, just get rid of this in our mind the there do would we say there's only one spiritual being no of course we wouldn't say that there's a lot of spiritual beings so we, we have to start thinking in terms of the way the Hebrew says it. The Hebrew does it not. The Hebrew says, there's only, think, think about it this way. <clears throat> On one hand, the Hebrew will say, hey, there's only one spiritual being. And we go, well, we know that's not true. But what, what does it mean when it says there's only one spiritual being? There's only one God. Okay? Mm -hmm. created spirit. Yeah, but we're talking, in reality, there's one that's above everything else. His name's Yahweh. He's, he, he's not derivative. He created everything. So um, it's kind of like saying, you know, man, there's only one basketball player that's the greatest. You know, we would we go, well, we know that there's obviously more, but we know what, we understand what you're saying. You're, you're speaking in the sense of, of idiomatic language to provide a distance. So we know there's only one creator. All the rest are still spiritual beings. But we have to get beyond... It's so amazing how much we, our, our prejudices, our presuppositions, our bias doesn't allow us to think outside the box. And so when the Bible talks about Elohim, it just means spiritual beings. And then it'll say, as we saw, oh, Yahweh, you are the Elohim of Elohims. You're the God of gods. Well, I thought there's only one God. Relax. Okay. He is the, the greatest spiritual being over all the other spiritual beings. That's what it means. Okay. So we're not into polytheism. That's a typical accusation against uh, Heiser and his book. And it's like, did he even read the book? I mean, he even addresses, are there more than one God? He, and he's, clearly there's not. There's, there's clearly not more than one Yahweh. Okay. I was uh, listening to um, some of the New Testament in... Um, I think it's John 10, 34, 35. I just tried to look it mm -hmm. up, but I'm not sure. But when Jesus is quoting the Old Testament and says, you are, we are God, so what's your issue with yeah. saying I'm a son of God? It was really interesting how he was using that, and it caught my attention due to our... Mm -hmm. um, We're going to get there. Here. Oh, okay. We are going to cover that because, and, and Bob just preached on it a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And um, Themes. The themes are there because... and. When, it, when we come to Psalm 82, which we're not there yet, that's going to be a really important passage. And then the fact that Jesus quotes it um, is super important too. Because all this, you think, well, why are we doing all this? Why do we understand Elohim, not Elohim? Well, in reality, to understand more intimately the, the nature of Jesus, we Jesus quotes Psalm 82, verse 6, Talking about Elohim, your gods, like you were mentioning. And uh, and Jesus is making an argument there about his own person. 
So if you go, well, what? Now, and I, I'll tell you this. Um, for years and years and years, I would read article after article after article about John 10, because I'm like, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> I, I, you know, I would read all these, and I was like, this is, there's something missing here in the sense of what Jesus is arguing. And I never really read a very good, logical, all the way down to, and I was like, gosh, you know, what, what's missing here? Well, then Heiser had written an article um, on John Tennant. It was the first one. I read it like three or four years ago, and I was like, now this is fitting the puzzle pieces. And I think that he, I think he is 90% right. I think he left some things, I, I think he got some things wrong. But um, nevertheless, I thought, wow, this finally brings the pieces together at what Jesus is arguing. And again, we'll get there and we'll discuss all that. Because um, if, we, if we want to understand our Lord, you know, if you really, you know, again, this isn't required for salvation or the gospel. But if you want to understand Jesus' argument about himself, this is all right into it. This is, this is laying the groundwork for that John 10. Okay, so what we're going to see today, we're going to finally get to Deuteronomy 32, but the Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 17, and Deuteronomy 29, what we said last time was that, okay, Yahweh, I'll just put him in here. Yahweh assigns, little g, be careful, gods to the nations, Okay. Yahweh assigns nations to the Elohim. So between Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy, what do I, it was 29 here, we have both sides of the equation. Now this is going to be, this is new information, honestly. Wait, what do you mean? God assigns them. Well, we know, um, in, and we've covered all this, but in the sense of bringing it together, in Daniel chapter 10, and chapter 12, we see that Michael, as an example, is the prince of Israel. He's the archangel. He's the, he's the Elohim. He's the God, if you want a little g. He's the spiritual being that has been assigned to protect Israel specifically. Well, then, well, and these are, we talked about these geographic designations. And then what we saw as well is uh, one of the angels there was telling Daniel, Hey, man, I, you start, the day you prayed, I was sent. To answer you. But man, the prince of Persia uh, interrupted me, intercepted me, and caused me trouble. And it took me three weeks. I had to call Michael to come help me in this spiritual battle for me to get here. And you're like, well, that's kind of weird. Um, and so you have a prince of Persia, this, this, um, this spiritual being that's overseeing Persia, Iran, and that area, okay? And then he says, hey, and when I leave here, on my way back, I gotta interact and fight with the prince of Greece. So now there's a spiritual being that's been assigned to Greece, which is another nation. So what you see here is um, these, these nations that have been um, assigned. And you go, well, where's that at in the Bible? Well, we have it in Deuteronomy 4, 17, and 29. And then in 32 is the clearest example. Because what he says is... Um, and well, let's go through it, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll show you some progression here, because super, super important. Um, and it, it, hopefully all the, some of the puzzle pieces will fit together for us as we see this unfold. So, remember, um, we're roughly 14, I'm going to say 1406 B.C., this is the Joshua uh, conquest, okay? This is where, after the 40 years, they're getting ready to go into the land, and Moses is on Mount Nebo. He says, I can't go in the land. I screwed up. You guys are going in. Let me give you a final encouragement. That's what Deuteronomy means. It means second law. So he's going to give them the law, the instructions. He's going to read. It's a little bit different. Some of the, the laws of Deuteronomy are different than the ones you find in Exodus because it's 40 years later. And some of the laws that he had given them um, were given for the sake of the 40-year wilderness wandering. Well, now they're going into the land. You know, they're going to spread out. They're going to have their own uh, allotments of land. And eventually, they're gonna, the tabernacle is going to be set up permanently. First, it started in Shiloh. 
and then it's going to end up eventually in Jerusalem. So God says, hey, Moses says, I'm going to give you the, the law again for your arrival into the land and for the next thousand years. Okay, so you see that that's why it's a little bit different. Okay, so as he's writing this, this is what he's telling him. So right at the top of page three, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you your elders and they will tell you. Okay. Hey guys, remember about this period of history. Okay. Because they didn't have, remember, they didn't have the Deuteronomy yet. They didn't have any of the written. It was all oral. And so that's the, the Torah, Genesis all the way through Deuteronomy, is written as a gift to them to t tell them about, really, their history from this point on, from basically Noah all the way down, okay? So ask, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples or the nations according to the number of the sons of God, okay? That's Deuteronomy 32, 7 through 8. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his allotted heritage. So on this page, you had all this allotment language, right? God says, hey, I allotted. Another way to say it, I put the word assigned. But if we want to say allotted here, we can. Also, what do you say if you, what's the verb for leaving an inheritance to somebody? Inheritance is a noun. What's the verb? Bequeath. Bequeath. That's good. Willed. Willed. That's good. So we're going to use those. Willed or bequeathed. We understand that language as inheritance language, right? So God allotted or signed or willed or bequeathed God to the nations. And he, same thing, nations to certain gods, okay? To certain Elohim spiritual beings. But, verse 9, the Lord's inheritance, his portion, is Jacob. So, there's a distinction being made here that Jacob, or we say Israel, is Yahweh alone. Okay? Now, that's just weird. Let's be honest. When did it happen? When he divided mankind. Well, when would he divide mankind? Babel. Okay? Using the same language. So like you said, you remember we said that that uh, the um, the flood was let's say 3300 BC. Okay, we'll do that there. So this is let's say this is 3000 BC. Okay. Now we're over here at 1400. So there's been, you know, what is that? 2600 years? 2500 years. Yeah. That's a lot of human history where nations have spread out and the nations are all around and they've gone everywhere, you know, Greece down to Egypt, Kush, all the way around, India, you name it. So now God is saying, hey, by the way, back here, when I divided the nations, I did something. I decided all you mankind was wicked sinners and I'm tired of you. So I'm done with you. I gave you a chance, I flooded the whole earth, I gave you a fresh start even, and you still had the Tower of Babel, trying to get a name for yourself, and I realized that you guys are, your heart is to be wicked continually. And not only that, but the language thing that you have that's similar, that unity is going to cause you more, it's going to cause you trouble. So I'm going to divide you all. And in fact, I'm going to distance myself from you, and I'm going to assign you to one of these other Elohim, these other... Now, he didn't assign them in order for them to worship them, but he gave, he basically said, okay, Greece, I'm going to assign you to this, I'm going to assign you to this, even though Greece didn't know that, okay? You, you know, pick a name, Raphael Zeus. or whatever, you know, pick a, well, Zeus. could be. <laughs> you, you're, he's a good angel, he's a good son of God, he's a good um, part of the divine council. He says, I'm going to assign you to Greece. <laughs> I want you to oversee it. I want you to, to, to rule them. I want you to encourage justice and righteousness. And we do, do good angels, do they participate in the moral fabric of society? See, we don't see that too often. Now, if I said, do bad angels contribute to society? 
We would say, well, of course they do. Good angels also do that. And that's what they were assigned to do was, I'm going to start here, assigned good Elohim. Okay. At one time, what it says here is he divided them up according to the sons of God. Now, this, this is in the, uh, some of your versions will say sons of Israel. You go, well, that's odd. Back here? Did Israel exist here? No. No. Mine says the Dead Sea Scrolls say sons of God. Bingo. The Dead Sea Scrolls say sons of God, clearly. And it doesn't make theological sense for it to be sons of Israel, because Israel didn't even exist. So how could God divide them amongst the sons of Israel, which didn't even exist at this time? Well, some will say, well, he was thinking prophetically. Well, that's a nice reach, theological reach, but that all the best manuscripts, even the, the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls, say sons of God. So it shows you that later... Jewish scribes changed it to sons of Israel, when in reality the originals don't. Bob, you can say something? Well, i just make a quick point where in Romans 1 we see the wrath of abandonment as God can, you know, steps back prim primarily. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that when God steps back, there's a chain reaction of consequences that the fallen nature of man bring upon ourselves. They're not, they're not necessarily a, it's a, it's a form of judgment, but it's a judgment in the sense that as he steps back, we kind of undermine ourselves. We, we're our own worst enemies we are. as humans. And this, this likewise is a wrath of abandonment. He's mm -hmm. stepping back, and the nations with these lesser, with the lesser Elohim, with the <coughs> sons of God, each one of these nations is now struggling because they don't have the, the direct uh, uh, leadership of God over right. them. So it's an, it's an interesting concept that we're you see over and over, yep. not over and over, but you see it. We do see it throughout, for sure. Yeah. But it, you know, when I first became a Christian at 18, I'm, you know, didn't know a single anything about the Bible, and I'm reading, and I'm, and I'm, as I'm beginning to read the Old Testament, I'm like, well, this is odd. Why does God only deal with Israel? That seems really unfair. I mean, that seems really unkind. Why isn't He reaching out, you know, to these other nations? Why, why, why? And it's an interesting thing, and until you know. We, this understanding, you go, uh, we don't know why. And I mean, we again, God sends Jonah to Nineveh, but was he, I think that the main point of the book of Jonah was about Jonah's bad attitude than it was about the Ninevites. They're just kind of, the book is not about Nineveh, even though they're included. The book is about Jonah, and it's about his bad attitude. And God sends him over there to his worst enemy in order to preach to him, and they end up getting saved, and God saves them as a lesson for Jonah's bad attitude. So it's interesting that for the most part, God sends, uh, speaks uh, oracles or judgments against many of the surrounding nations of Israel through the prophets, right? Isaiah speaks a lot about Egypt and Syria and Babylon, and we see all those things. But it doesn't mean that God is active in those particular nations. It's just, we don't see it. Now, is it possible? Theoretically, I guess, but... You, you would have no scripture, it's simply speculation, Mike. Uh, and, and read the books. I still come up with a little conundrum. Just real quick, you can go laterally with this. We've got good gods, right? Supposedly. Call them angels if you want, but the Bible calls them, you know. We'll call them angels, it makes it easier. Yeah, you know. Um, so he sends them out. He puts these nations into their hands as far as a sense of responsibility. Jurisdiction, care, yep, yeah, management. Management's good. But what we see is we see these nations raising up. Now here, here's the conundrum: the foreign gods. Now Greece, good example. Zeus, da 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 da, Rome, Saturn. Were these in representation? That human raising these up. Uh, I'm coming from pagan culture. Did they expose themselves? To the human race, did they, um, and culturally, is that how it assisted in coming into belief of foreign gods? Which, by the way, Yahweh himself turned on at a later date. Mm -hmm. I think that what you're going to, so let me, I'll answer that. Because what we're going to see is, if we were to put this here, okay, so this is, uh, this is Joshua, okay? Here, we're going to put in the Exodus, okay? 
We'll get to this. Put Jacob in here somewhere too, will you? Yeah, we can put Jacob right here. Okay, because he's a key factor. Okay. So, what I'm going to do next time is I'm going to go through the each of the evidences in the book of Exodus because that's the next thing on the agenda. Because what God says in the Exodus is not only am I going to bring them out, but I'm going to judge what? I'm going to judge the gods of Egypt. Right. See, we tend to think, oh, wait, you mean the stone? You mean that statue? Were those no. appointed by him? I, well, what you have is between the time of Genesis of Babel, right, we're they started about. good, and then somewhere in there, they rebel. The, these sons of God. Okay. They, they decide to have worship for themselves. They're like, I'm not going to like this. Well, so somehow they rebel, and they encourage Zeus. They create these pantheon right. of this. Can you scripturally? No. It's, just, yeah. it's, it's a deduction. Okay. And why, well, how do we know they rebel? Well, we do know because Psalm 82, right. which we haven't got to, describes them as not doing what God had originally told them to do. Right. And he starts chewing them out. Yep. Psalm 82 says, God, Yahweh stands in the midst of the Elohim. And he's going to provide judgment. Well, God doesn't judge Michael. Michael's faithful. But God stands in the midst of the Elohim, and he's going to judge them and say, you guys did not do what you were assigned to do, which was to encourage righteousness and justice and mercy. And therefore, your judgment is you're going to die like human beings. And so we'll get there later. But there is that aspect. So what we do know is they're assigned, and somehow there they rebel. And Psalm 82 addresses that. I, I, I knew you were going to get there. Yeah. I just thought it might be a good thing to bring Yeah, up. Linda? So, just to clarify, so you're saying these Elohim are different than the ones that left with Satan? Correct. Okay, so there's a whole different. Well, well this is well, what we. <laughs> okay, let's go back to that. Because remember, we spent a whole class period in Genesis 12. Talking about, or in Revelation 12, talking about how that does not prove that Satan defected with a third of the angels back here. That's not the case. If you look at the chronology, you, you can't prove it. So all we know scripturally is that Satan defected alone here. At first. At first. There could have been more, but we just can't prove it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> when Genesis 6 comes along, we know that some of these other sons of God that were part of the divine council, defected, came down and mated with human women, caused a whole bunch of trouble there. So that, that's another group that defected. When? At least here. Um, how many? I don't know. Then what we know is there's still sons of God in the council, and God decides, okay, I'm going to separate the nations according to the number of the sons of God that he had in his divine council. He's going to sign them, and he's going to make this thing. Well, then, post this, somewhere along the line, they defect again. And they seek to encourage worship of themselves, which seems very satanic, right? Because that's what Lucifer wanted. Uh, we saw that from Isaiah 14. I will be like the Most High. And we know that the ultimate goal in Revelation, all through the book of Revelation, especially Revelation 13, what does Satan want? He wants worship, and he gets it. At the end, the whole world worships the dragon. Okay, So we see this consistency, but somehow we're just lacking information. Then if we fast forward to Psalm 82, we see where God says, Your judgment's coming, guys, because I assigned you to this, and you didn't do it. Now what we do know is that when they rebelled, God didn't necessarily take away their jurisdiction. Because we, how do we know that? Well, Daniel 10. You have the Prince of Greece and the Prince of Persia, which we just talked about, which are have already rebelled because they're interfering with God sending that angel to Daniel. And he's a wicked angel, that wicked prince. He's, he's, he's getting in the way and interfering with God's plan. And God had to remove him. He's still called the Prince of Persia. Prince is a very rulership-oriented word. So they're still there, and the Scots like, uh, no, I haven't removed you yet. Your time's coming, though, and I'll, that's all me too. Bob, you're gonna say something? Well, just real, real quick. Um, in this day and age, there's a lot of people doing prophecies and dreams and visions all over the internet, talking about the judgment of America. America's being judged. America's being judged. America's being judged. And and then then there's the call to repent, like Nineveh. In this day and age, 
just put this to rest. Do you think God will still judge nations, or is, is it just a judging of the world, like in Acts 17, it says that, that God's appointed a, a person to judge the world, which is Christ, right? So there's a world judgment we see that we're yeah. waiting for. That makes sense to me. It, are the nations like we see still being a judge? You know, I think you're talking collectively, right? What I don't see, it, well, 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 I'll show you. We'll, we'll get there, hopefully. In Acts 17, Paul brings this idea up. Because he, he's there speaking to the, the Greeks. Yeah. And he says, God now, you mean he didn't before? God now, commit, Acts 17, 30. God now commands everyone everywhere to repent. Where before, God didn't command the Ninevites to repent specifically, or let's just say Greece as a nation. So what you see in Acts 17, really in Acts chapter 2, is the gospel goes out. What the theology is hard to pin down, but the theology would seem that what God started in Genesis 11, in Acts chapter 2, he undoes. He says, okay, now the gospel is to go out to where? Everywhere. All nations. Yep. I wasn't doing that before. I was only working with Israel. But now the gospel is undoing his abandonment of the Babel incident, which is beautiful. And it's interesting that when we get there, we'll look at Acts chapter 2 eventually very consistently. I'll give you a couple maps. But the nations represented in Acts chapter 2, it lists them. Hey, there was Jews from this nation, this nation. And you go, why would Luke write that? Interestingly, they're the exact nations listed in Genesis 10, the same geographic region. That, so it says, as if Luke opens Genesis 10 and goes, oh, there was way there, here, and he chose these very specific ones to represent the geographical entity, and we'll get into cosmic geography, of Babel. The gospel is meant to undo God's, what, where God distanced himself before, the gospel says, I'm not distancing myself. In fact, I'm out for all of it. And part of the church age is to reconquer every tribe, tongue, nation, people from these rebellious gods. And God's like, I'm going to, the gospel's going to disarm them all publicly. Colossians 2.15. Go ahead, Mike. Back up a little bit. You spoke a little order. You said for, let's call them angels instead of gods. Yep. But you've got to remember, um, don't we, or am I making a mistake here? We talked about, I'm taking us back a little bit. Uh, Satan comes out. Not necessarily the first rebellion, but he falls. Like a bolt of light, and boom, you know, comes down to the earth. Maybe goes back and her had already coerced. We know there was a war, a third of the angels. A third of the angel war is now in the future. It? It's not in the past. Okay. Well, it could be at he, the time of Jesus' oh, birth. Remember Revelation 12, he spent... Well, let's just look at the watchers. Were those, in fact, the Elohim as in God, or were they angels? The watchers are, um, remember, the, Elohim is a broad word. It includes everyone. I know, I know. It's so the watchers, word. though, are equivalent with, to, I'm going back right here, to hierarchy. watchers are equivalent to the sons of God. Okay. They're rulers. They're okay. part of the divine council. That's why in Daniel 4, when Nebuchadnezzar screws up, He's he. it says, by decree of the watchers, he used to go out and spend seven years growing long fingernails and long hair. It's the decree of the watchers. Well, that's interesting. The watchers are, it's just another word for the sons of God. Yeah, I just wanted to get that mm -hmm. separated. Yeah. that the so, angels are below. Yeah, if you look at the hierarchy, the watchers and the sons of God, I think, are synonymous <laughs> offices, just different labels, right. okay? And the reason why is because in the book of Enoch, it's the watchers that come down and mate with women. And Genesis 6 says it's the sons of God that come down and mate with women. In that, in that vein, of, in the 19th chapter, it says that when you, Enoch is doing the tour of heaven, yeah. Ural, that's one of the guys giving the angels, giving him the uh, tour, it says, here, are, here will stand the angels who have connected themselves with women and their spirits, assuming many forms, are defiling mankind and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons, that is, yep. as gods, 
and here they will stand till the day of the great judgment in which they shall be judged till they are made an end. There's, yes, there's a lot going on. And now, in Daniel 4, the decree of the watchers, those were good watchers. Those were faithful watchers. They hadn't rebelled yet. So there still are sons of God that are faithful. There's still watchers that are faithful. Michael's one of them. Michael's in that prince category. Bill, you got something? You just answered it. So, oh. so you could you could say we had watchers then, we have watchers later, but it's there's a whole the group of watchers. Package. Some of them defected. Yeah. Some of them some, stayed faithful. Some good, some bad. Yep. And what? Remember, super important too. At the time of the flood, okay, the Nephilim they die, but their spirits live on as what? Demons. 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 Walk in the earth. So, according to the book of Enoch, chapter 15, any demon that you would interact with today, hopefully you wouldn't, is a spirit of the Nephilim that were killed. Either here, or also at the time of David, the time of the conquest, right? So just kind of, so I can wrap my mind around this, in regards to Satan, Satan, God, God has his host. Now, are these other, quote, sons of God that rebelled, are they all under Satan? Are they... Scholars would say, him? yes, that Satan is, he has a kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. Matthew 12. Mm -hmm. Sa Satan can't be divided against himself, or else his kingdom wouldn't stand. And there he's specifically talking about these demons. So what you do see is that Satan, for whatever reason, especially Revelation 12, Satan and his angels fought against Michael and his angels. So there's possession there. So... Whether, I doubt they all get along well, because they're all self-serving, but in reality, they have to acknowledge Satan's influence. Um, his, it's a kingdom, it's orchestrated, it's organized, it is, it is a kingdom in that regard. And when they do fight at the end, or whatever that, I think Revelation 12 is a battle in, I think, the future, in the tribulation. I think, we, we went through that whole thing. The... Satan still is the leader of this group of other spiritual beings, Elohim, wherever they fall in the rain, or two really demons all the out specifically as such to the scripture in accordance with this theory or that the teaching that's relatively new. It never really does come out. Although in your in your uh, you provided us a document, a few pages that has Satanology. Yes. And you Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's rather logical and inherent that yeah. you've got to have a mob leader. So. you got to, and, and he is called the leader. He, In yeah, fact, in, in Matthew 12, he's called the prince, there's that word again, of the demons. Right. And that doesn't mean he is a demon. So I think demons right. and sons of God or fallen angels or fallen watchers, they're not the same. These demons are those. But some people believe that demons and fallen angels are identical. I don't, but whatever. Um, but And some people say, well, if Satan is a demon. No, I don't think so. But, well, they say, well, he's a ruler of the demons. Well, just because you're a ruler of the demon doesn't mean you have to be a demon. He's still a That's just part of the kingdom. And he's is, still there, a... can, uh, here, on, Jerry. Uh, is there a difference between uh, the spiritual world and the physical world? Because a lot of times, if you go back on that, uh, again, that chapter 20 we read, read together before the class, it said there's one, uh, you're else, a holy angel over the world. And then the next one, Raphael, is the holy angel over the spirits of men. And then another one, is Ra uh, Ragel, is over the world of luminaries. So is there luminaries, spirits, and the physical world? Well, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is there, you might say, multi-dimensions? Not necessarily. Well, there's two dimensions. There's the physical and then there's the spiritual. What's the luminaries? Then? So luminaries are, you can see this in the book of Jude as well. <clears throat> Basically, it's just another word for spiritual beings. Like, you know, sometimes they're called stars, right? And we go, well, is this reference to a literal star or a figurative star? Because angels are, especially in Revelation 120, Jesus holds his hand and, and the churches and the, he stands and he holds the stars. And you go, well, what stars? And then it says, oh, the star was the angel. So it's hard to, to always understand, is it literal or is it figurative? And a lot of times, according to the, at least especially the Old Testament, in the poetic literature, it's both at the same time. Well, there's one that says he guards the holy angels who are, are who are over the spirits who sin in the spirit. So there's one guarding an angel that's 
for the ones that's sinning in the spirit. So that there's a, a there, division there. There's definitely a so in our hierarchy. Again, we we have if you want to put Satan at the top, fine. But do you have fallen watchers, fallen you know fallen sons of God? You have um, other fallen beings. You you would have um, other servant angels that are more at the lower level. Then at the bottom, I think at the bottom of the bottom is these demons. Because why? They're half of each group. Well, that all makes sense because if the last was Gabriel, one of the holy angels over paradise, and the serpents and cherubim. So, so that's. That's talking about the saved, right? So the, the, the correct. So what you have, remember, what we, what we don't see is the extent of how much the divine council, the good angels, are involved in our existence, especially as Christians. But we know in Matthew eighteen ten, we talked about it there. That man, don't sin against a child. Why? Because. Their angel always sees the face of my Father in heaven. You go, really? Guardian angels? There you go. I mean, Matthew 18.10 is the only verse that really we, is that powerful. We have to go back to, Jerry, just something I had to think about. I'm not saying I'm right, but the fall of man changed. Some of the dynamics. Changed a lot of the dynamics mm -hmm. and some of the words that we're reading. Uh, and not not the definition of the words, but they got brought out, and some things got left behind, whereas new things were created. Yeah. But they use the same verbiage as that. So I related to, uh, like in Enoch, I re related into the New Testament some things, newness. Yep. You know, so and it changes. On that, what we discussed in Genesis three was the Garden of Eden motif. You know that whole imagery because it's very common in the, in the Near Eastern literature. But the idea, the implication—it's not proof, but the not implication no, no, was that there. the spiritual realm and the physical realm were in harmony, mm -hmm. and the, the Garden of Eden was a place of interaction, gateway, if you want to call it that way. Some people do, so that when um, Satan shows up to talk to her. She's not like, well, who are you? I've never seen you before. I've never seen anybody like you. I've only been connecting with Yahweh, the creator. He created us. But... So it wasn't a shock to her. And therefore, when Satan says, hey, if you eat at the tree, you're going to be like one of the other Elohim. Mm -hmm. She didn't go, what Elohim? I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. So that you had this interaction taking place, which was in a state of innocence or goodness. And they both were sharing common knowledge. I wouldn't be opposed to that necessarily. But then when Satan interrupted it, God said, well, this doesn't go well. I'm going to create a hard line separation between the two, between the spiritual realm and the physical realm. That's why later in, De in the law, Deuteronomy, you were not allowed to cross that border into the spiritual realm through diviners which is, remember, the word diviner is the word nachash, it's the word serpent, it's the word, so it's all the same. You would just have to assume, now, no proof to this, but the physical world changed drastically from oh, for what sure. God had intended. So my assumption leads me to think logically, especially as I get further through the Old Testament, that the spiritual world changed also. No doubt. And that's why God... Especially in Colossians chapter 2, it talks about us being very wary of trying to have anything to do with angels. Because God knows how that worked out, right? He, he sent them over here, or, or this, and man, that didn't work out well. And so now he said, I'm going to cut that off because and I'm only going to allow it basically one-sided. So a Gabriel will show up to Mary, right? He shows up to Zacharias in, in Luke. And God allows angels to show up to, to Daniel. But we aren't ever called to seek out the protection of our guardian angel, to talk to our any angels or an angelic world. We are never encouraged to any of that. We connect with the Father and Him alone. That's it. And Most Paul warns that. Don't get sucked in these angels' well, they're, things. They're uh, commanded also. We're commanded also. No mediums, no Right. Don't, if you don't try to cross that, death. Don't screw around with ghosts and witches. Don't screw around with ghosts and witches. Yeah, I because mean, God knows that they're real. Well, when we cross over that boundary, yeah. the good angels are saying, 
Can't talk to you unless we have permission. We don't have permission, but the fallen angels are going, this is great. Oh yeah, I'm the departed. I was a kid that died, you know, and you're on the Ouija board, and I'm eight years old, and a bunch of lies and deception, and in order to create bondage, and oh, just open yourself up, you know, please help me, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> Wrong. So God knows not zero tolerance in that. Because the why? Is it's true. It's true. They are there. And they're going to create havoc. So, all right, let's, what we have here at the top, God, he gave to the nations their inheritance, their, their spiritual beings to rule over them. He also fixed the boundaries of the nations uh, according to the number of these watchers, these sons of God, which were good at the time. But, so imagine this here. When God does this at Genesis 11, For a brief moment, which nation is God working with? None. Or none. Of them. None. Well, they don't exist. They don't. No, they do exist. He divided them. Well, that's right. All this They're time. abandoned. He has nobody. So, but he says, but so Moses is looking back, but the Lord's inheritance is his people, Jacob. So what? See, this is beautifully contextually, theologically consistent. Because why? What's the next thing that we have in Genesis, at the end of Genesis 11? Or actually, I think I have it. Um, let's go to... Uh, well, Shem is the blessed line, right? It's right. I, I don't have it on here. That's okay. It doesn't matter. I'm on 11 if you want to read something. What's the last verse, two verses of Genesis 11? Last two verses. Um, the Tower of Babel incident. It's all through Genesis 11. What's yeah, the last two verses? He just talks about last Dude, verse with Terah read, lived read for it. five oh, years. Read it. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, Haram, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, and the wife of his son Abram, and gave together they set out for Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Okay. But then, but when they came to Haran, they settled there. Okay. And Terah lived 205 years, and he died. He's giving a genealogy. Of who? Abraham's father. Abraham's dad. Yeah. See, he merely, see, Moses is writing and saying, hey, guys, God did, distanced himself from all the nations, and then there was nothing. And God said, you know, I've done with all you nations. I'm going to create a new nation for myself from zero. From nothing. I'm going to pick some guy, some random guy, some Babylonian guy, and I'm going to make of him a great nation, and from him, he's going to be my inheritance because I've abandoned all of you. I'm going to create my own. <coughs> and I'm going to make them, I am going to be their God. I've assigned you guys to these other Elohim spiritual beings or them for jurisdiction over you. I'm going to create one myself from this one guy. I'm going to be the jurisdiction king of that one, and I'm gonna reveal myself to him, and through him, I'm gonna fulfill my plan of redemption. Because I tried to leave it all open for you, yeah, who's over here, and you just rebelled, and you decided to create a tower and a name for yourself, so I'm done with you. <clears throat> I'm, I left you to yourself. Is God okay to do that? Sure he is. That's the, that's the theology of this distancing. You really, as the way you're presenting it, you really suppose it was, uh, Anger, abandonment, uh, or wrath, abandonment. Uh, I mean, sure. just the way you're putting it out. I look at it as okay. This is what you want. Well, this is what you're gonna get. I think that God is always angry with the wicked every day, right? Psalm seven eleven. Okay. <laughs> and so, right. but, but Which was his right. motivation is pure. My my presentation was not okay. But his <laughs> no, motivation no, no. I, is I'm pure. Say you're giving the uh, right. He's bam, well. Know. We do know that he was sad that he was grieved that he made man because yeah. they're yeah. and then he goes through and then oh stinking humanity they're doing this again fine okay so what we see in what could be written in the book of Genesis which is a, a billion different things Moses is telling this group hey by the way after this here's the here's where you came from you came from this guy named Terah who had two kids neighbor neighbor right and then Sarah Sarai the the, the, the half sister Okay, and they left from the Ur of the Chaldeans or Babylon up, and they ended up up here in Haran, which is 
like Syria, eastern Syria. So they leave here. This is all Babylon, Iran. They go up here. So then what you see, and then Genesis 12, verse 1, which there's no chapter versions, okay? It says, and God had said to Abram, leave your country, leave your people. And I'm, I'm going I'm to take you there. Yeah, but he because, didn't. That's because Terah was worshiping a false god. We know that from Joshua 24, verse 2, that he was an idol worshiper across the river. <clears throat> so God picks this idol worship, this guy who's part of that idol worshiping family and says, I'm going to reveal myself to him. I'm going to rescue him. I'm going to save him. And I'm going to make myself, I'm going to assign myself. That's pretty cool. You get Yahweh. I'm going to assign myself to be his God, his direct spiritual being, Elohim, and all of his descendants. And they're going to be my special possession. So what I have here in the rest of this is, uh, let's see, got allotted, got it abandoned. Okay, Deuteronomy 4, 7. Same thing. Moses is writing it over here. For what great nation is there that has an Elohim so near it to it as is the Lord our God whenever we call on him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? Even these other Elohim, these other spiritual beings, these little gods, if you want to say that, they were limited in how directly they could even access themselves. What you don't see is Michael appearing or these other uh, spiritual beings appearing to them. Well, in Scripture, at least. Um, were they influencing them? Yes. And then after they rebelled, they were influencing them for negativity. And they were teaching. That's why in 1 Timothy 4.1... It talks about the doctrines of demons, teachings of demons. The demons are going and they are influencing humanity through bad teachings, just like their fathers did, which we saw back here at the time of the flood. Remember what were the watchers doing? Teaching bad things. And so the demons are just like that, just like their dad in that regard. They're false teachers. So in the same way, the good angels, at, the, at least at one time, were trying to influence things for good, for righteousness, for mercy, and then they rebelled and they decided to take on worship from themselves. And then they taught Zeus, all these pagan gods. So when we look at the Exodus, God says, I'm going to judge the gods of Egypt, the Elohim, we'll say it that way. He's not talking about an idol. He's not talking about a piece of stone. He's talking about real beings. Because how do we know that? You know, this is an inanimate object. It's not going to influence anything. However, when, and what we see there is the battle that takes place. Moses throws down his rod. It becomes a snake. Well, what do the magicians do? Was, it, was that real? Or, was, or do we say, no, it's a sleight of hand. It wasn't real. It's fake. It was just to the eye. The Bible does not say that it was some scholars. Even R.C. Sproul, I heard him one time, he said that was fake. It was sleight of hand. And I'm like, what? Man, you're not taking it at face value. So these other Elohim have real power, and now there's a square off going on. Yahweh said, these guys have been manipulating and hurting my kids, my inheritance, for several hundred years, centuries. And I'm, when I bring them out, I'm going to judge them. And so what we'll go through is we'll see that these spiritual beings were given to like the god of denial or you know or the god of death or all these different names these were all we have a prince of persia we have a prince of greece we have a prince of prince of egypt did they in fact have their own high art? correct there's many different gods so now does it mean that there weren't idols yes of course there were idols we're not saying that but god isn't going to judge the idol isn't creating this turning this the rod into a snake or turning the water into blood, right? That's real power that God was allowing to take place uh, in order to square off with these guys, okay? Uh, 2 Samuel 7 says the same thing. What nation on the earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people and to make a name for himself, to do great things? Uh, look, look at it. And to do great things for you and awesome things for your land. Before your people, whom you have redeemed for yourself from Egypt, from nations and their gods. So here, it says that God redeemed Jacob out of the nations and from the nation's gods, right here. So Yahweh saying, I didn't assign 
the, the God of uh, Greece to you. I redeemed you out of that. Abraham was part of that system. God says, I'm taking you out and I'm going to make you my own and I'm going to rescue you from the gods of your ancestors, the, the real literal spiritual beings that have a jurisdiction or assignment over you. And that's what they're saying here. Deuteronomy 7, you are holy people to the Lord. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. For you are a holy people. The Lord has chosen you to be a people. And he again says the same thing. Um, now this is interesting. In Deuteronomy 32, right after this section uh, we saw up here, he goes on, he says, verse 9, the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is a lot of heritage. That's the top. And then down at 10, God found him in a desert land, and in the howling waste of the wilderness, he encircled him, he cared for him, he kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up his nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. The Lord alone guided him. No foreign god was with him. That's Would important. That translated as idol? No. Okay. You could. Well, that's the argument. You know. What I understand. Do. The Elohim, there's no doubt the word Elohim can refer to a, a piece of stone. Like this. Okay. But I think that how, context has to determine whether it's in reference to the spiritual being behind the idol or the idol itself. Okay. But here, the Lord, the Lord alone guided him. No foreign spiritual being was with him. He made him ride high in the places, ate the produce. Uh, let's go down to 15. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, stout, and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him. He's talking about Israel. And scoffed at the rock of the salvation. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, or Elohims, spiritual beings. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were not Elohim, to Elohim, or to gods that they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. So what, what he's saying is, in this, what we see, what do we know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Did they worship any false deities? No. no. Not after God revealed. Not, not to our knowledge. They were loyal. Now, Jacob, what does he say to Rachel? Remember? <laughs> she brought her own. She brought her house idols. <laughs> right. Because Rachel was, see, remember, they moved over here to Canaan. Then they sent Jacob back up here to Haran, where the Arameans to um, the, the to Laban, to Rebekah's brother. So he's still, they're still all entrenched in their foreign gods, their foreign deities. She comes down and she's just bringing what she knows, her Aramean deities. And so Jacob says, put those things away. Put those, we're, we're, I'm worshiping Yahweh himself. I don't want any other trouble. I'm faithful to him alone. That's what he's saying here, that in this process of time, the Israelites began to worship new Elohim. It's, it's, it's weird. New gods that they had never known. That your fathers never feared. God's like, I'm ticked because at you, this is real ticked, because when I chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had never known any other deity except me. I re re redeemed them from the falseness. And now what has happened is all these rebelled uh, uh, angels over here are coming down and encroaching in on the people of Israel, trying to get their loyalties away. But there was a connection there also with the demons at the time. Correct. They walking the earth because they came from the other end. Yep. And drew them off as well. This Doctrines of demons. An attack on the goodness of God. Yep. And they're trying to get... It's always Yahweh against all these other rebelled, rebellious, including Satan. It's always him. That's the battle. I'm going to judge him. And at Psalm 82, I'm going to judge you in the end. God's going to get victory over them. So that's what you see here. Um, that they had... So let's go to the last page. We'll wrap it up. Um, we should have time for this. Yeah, we time. What's interesting here, this comes straight out of um, Michael Heiser's book as well as his Demons book. But this is interesting to me. And we, don't, we don't tend to think this way, uh, especially, and nor should we, uh, in the sense of because we're, we're dealing with the New Testament theology. And here's what I mean. Is, um, 
Okay, we're going to go like this. This is the Med Sea, all right? Okay, here's Israel. Here's Egypt. Um, we have, this would just be basically be Syria today. And then we have, uh, this is all Syria. And then over here you have the, Medi the Euphrates River. So you have Aram, okay? Or Babylon, all that area, okay? It's interesting that because of, remember, there is geography, right? So if we, if we go over here, you have Greece. So you have the Prince of Greece, which is a geographical designation. Well, Yahweh, he says, I'm putting my name on this piece of land. That's very specific. This is my land. And in fact, he talks about how the land will vomit you out if you do all these other things of the sins of the, of the surrounding nation. So what you have is these pagan gods, these real spiritual beings, have their land allotment, and they're always trying to get in on this one. That's why in, after Genesis 12, into 14, in the land of Israel, um, let's put the Jordan River, this area over here uh, is the land of Bashan, and then this is Mount Hermon, okay? In, even in Genesis 14, the Rephaim are here, which is another term for giants. And then when they come back, as we said a couple of weeks ago, when they come back and they come in to conquer the land, they come in around, they don't come in this way, the land is filled with Nephilim. That's Numbers 13. Because they're trying to hold off the land. This is God's land, very special. And so what you see is you see some hints here about the theology of the people of Israel going, well, I, if I leave, if I leave here, then I can get away from Yahweh because, or, or either that or I don't want to leave here because I don't want to get away from Yahweh. If you're Jonah, what do you do? <laughs> you try to flee to Tarshish, which is way over here. Okay, but here, David says, David's having this battle with Saul. And let's see. I'm trying to think. Well, let's just read it. Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice. He also said, Why then is my Lord pursuing his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in my hand? Now, therefore, please let my Lord the king listen to the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is men, cursed are they before the Lord. For they have driven, they have driven me out today, so that I would have no attachment with the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now then, do not let my blood fall to the ground away from the presence of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out. And he goes on. So you have this idea of, I don't want to miss out on the attachments of the inheritance. Now, what we do know is that not only is Israel the people called God's inheritance, but the land is his inheritance. And so David is saying, they're trying to get me out of the land and drive me out so that I would go serve other gods, because if I get out of the land... Those are the only gods that you can serve are the ones out there. So that's kind of the imagery here. And then this is 1 Samuel's good too, where you guys know the story about the ark being captured. Let's start in verse 2. The Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the temple of Dagon, where they positioned it beside Dagon, their idol. When the residents of Ashdod got up early the next day, Dagon was lying on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him back in his place. But when they got up early the following day, Dagon was again lying on the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and his two hands were sheared off and were lying at the threshold or the step. Only Dagon's body was left intact. For this reason, this is really interesting, verse 5. For this reason, to this very day, neither Dagon's priest nor anyone else who entered Dagon's temple stepped on Dagon's threshold in Ashdod. What they're saying, what it's saying is, in, in this, in this, Basically, temple area, well, I can just do it here. It's as if God reclaimed that piece of dirt by conquering Dagon. So now when they would walk in, they'd walk around it. Because they're like, well, that's Yahweh's spot. I'm not going to, yeah, we know what happened to Dagon there. I'm not going to touch that piece of dirt because I don't want to get Yahweh's judgment. So here you have God conquering a piece of dirt. And these guys in their theology will not... It's interesting. They don't go anywhere near 
And they, yet they keep entering the temple. They keep entering the, the temple. Day <laughs> exactly. So go figure that one out. Um, the last one here, we got time. You guys know about Daniel 10, but this is fascinating too. These are just hints of this cosmic geography about how important the land itself is in the Old Testament. I'm not saying this is true in the New Testament. Because in fact, in John chapter 4, when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, she says, well, I'm going to ask you a theological question. You guys say that Jerusalem is the place to worship. And we say it's here on Mount Gerizim, not Ebal. You know. And Jesus says, hey, there's coming a time when they'll be able to worship here on this mountain. God worships in spirit, and, you know, he's spirit, and he's a, he's a, God is a spirit, and he seeks worshipers to worship in the spirit and truth. So location is going to be irrelevant. There's coming a time. It wasn't there yet. That's fascinating to me that Jesus was kind of acknowledging that there's this special thing, at least under the Old Testament theological umbrella, but once the, as we said, once Acts chapter 2 comes, the whole earth is filled with the glory of the Lord, and it's our job to go out there and reclaim, reconquer through the power of the gospel all of the nations, including all of the lands as well. So you see that. But here, um, Naaman, great Syrian king, has leprosy. You guys know the story. So he and his entire entourage returned to the prophet after he got healed. Seven, he dipped in the water seven times. Naaman came and stood before him. He said, for sure... I know that there is no God in all the earth. There's no real true God except in Israel. Now please accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha said, As certainly as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will take nothing from you. Naaman insisted that he take it, but he refused. Naaman said, If not, then, please give your certain a servant a load of dirt, enough for a pair of mules to carry. For your servant will never again offer a burnt offering or a sacrifice to a God other than Yahweh. May the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon, another false god, or another deity there, to worship, and he leans on my arm, and I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord, may Yahweh forgive your servant for this. Elisha said, go in peace. So he takes this load of dirt, he, as much as his, you know, mules would carry. Think, why? In their theology... This was Yahweh's dirt. Holy ground. Holy ground. I'm going to take it with me so that when I lay it down there and I worship Yahweh, I'm connecting with him and his dirt and his land. And Elisha didn't say, you got the theology all wrong, buddy. He just says, go for it. Okay. Absolutely. How it all worked, we don't know. But it's, these, see that these are just out. hints. We see that play out in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century something spirits. Holy ground. Holy ground. Holy spot. And I think from a New Testament perspective, no. Mm -hmm. But at least God was, because of this distancing, so let's wrap it up. God distanced himself here, abandoned all the nations to themselves, to these other beings, decides I'm going to make a new nation, and they're never going to know any other, they better not know any other God than me, because I'm going to reveal myself to them in a very special way, in a very miraculous way, come down, God there, God's presence shows up in the tabernacle by a pillar, you know, a pillar of fire, um, cloud. That's pretty amazing. God shows up on uh, Mount Sinai. I'm going to come down. I'm going to visit with you. You better watch out. It's a serious business. We don't see any other God allowing any of these other beings to do that. That's why Moses is like, dude, we have a great which other nation has so near to their deity that we do? And we recognize none. But somewhere in there, they begin to rebel. And there's going to come a day when God will judge them. And so we'll see that. But any final questions? Otherwise, next time, we'll go through and I'll show you some of the things in the, in the Near Eastern literature about, um, exi or about the Exodus and God judging the gods. Thoughts? Yeah, Bob? I think I'm going to go to Israel and uh, grab some dirt and start selling it on Amazon. Does anybody else want to invent? This is my new startup company. <laughs> Holy uh, ground, so right? For $10,000, you can buy a chair. And, uh, hey, Bob, you can sell the dirt. Every Catholic shut down. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Relics. All right. Well, if that's it. Holy water.
So does everybody grasp what, we're, what, we, what, what we have here? Deuteronomy 32 is an amazing passage when looked at in all of the context of what happened. Um, you know what, let's actually, we got two minutes. We got 10, 15. Isn't that what it's supposed to be? Mm -hmm. Let's go to Acts 17 really quick. Let's wrap it up here. Um, we'll see what Paul, we might, we'll probably get to this again later. Um, this is about the uh, unknown God. Okay. We'll start at verse 24. Acts 17, verse 24. He's talking to these Jews. They have all these idols out there. He says, The God who made the world, the Creator, Yahweh, and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Well, when did he do that? That's Deuteronomy 32. He says God fixed, if you look at that here, he says in verse 8, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided Macon, he fixed the borders of the peoples. So very clear that he fixed the borders. That's what Paul is saying here. He fixed the borders and the boundaries, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Perhaps. It's really fascinating. God did it in order, his, his desire was that they would find him, even though he distanced himself. He, he, he set up to do it. So that's what Paul is saying here. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we move, move live, and have our being. Um, look at verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. And he goes on. So what, what you have that is this is what God did back then, but now he commands everyone ever to repent because there's a time coming of judgment through one man, Jesus Christ, and raising from the dead. And that just sent them all. They didn't like the resurrection idea. But Paul is alluding here to this fixing of the nations of the boundaries and the only place that, that ever appears in all of scripture is Deuteronomy 30. Now there's what you see in Genesis 10 this is the last little teaser. In Genesis 10 you have 70 nations represented. Some versions will have 72 like the Septuagint will have 72 depending on how they divide the names. Okay, So 70 nations well, interestingly, in Matthew 10, Luke 10, um, Jesus sends out how many disciples to preach the gospel? 70. 70 or 72. You have manuscripts for both. They went in pairs. Is that coincidental? It's exactly like what happened in Genesis 11, that he divided them up according to the 70 number or the 72 number, and that's how many Jesus sent out. And it's really, really fascinating. He, he's signaling. I'm sending out my 72. Not that they went to the other parts of the world. I'm not saying that. But it's a signal of what would happen in Acts chapter 2 when all the nations there were represented. It's really fascinating to see Jesus saying, just wait, it's coming. And Genesis 10, 32 says, these are the clans of Noah's sons according to their lines and descendants yep. from within the nation. That's how it ends. And then Genesis 11 begins as shares the Tower of Babylon Smith. So Moses is writing backwards and saying, let me tell you how we got here. 70 nations. Oh, we know about 70 nations. There's been 2,500 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is how it happened. And then there was this, separated languages. And then when we look at back historically, we say, well, we know how the language is developed. Secular linguistic studies, they don't really know. I'm, I'm talking from an evolutionary perspective, how all the different languages appear. So anyways. All right. Well, let's pray. Father heaven, we thank you that... Uh, this is deep. It's fun. It's exciting to get this, this very in-depth understanding of what you've been doing throughout history and how the fruit of the gospel is to reach all the nations and to help us to do that and to give us wisdom as always in Jesus' name. Amen.